start right there. We got right to the ticket 1718s. And you can see that that was a structure I gave you just before it did that. We uh, talked about this being a one-third structure just here between these three areas. And we said that that was your target price, 1718s. So it traded there. So that was a nice, well, if you took it, guys, that was a nice $1,800 profit for the, uh, for the uh, gold, guys. What a trade, guys. Beautiful. Sensational. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. It's just practice, Rick. That's that's all it is. It's just practice. When you look at uh, practicing drawing brackets and things like that, it's not supposed to gather dust on a shelf. It's not something that's supposed to sit there gathering dust and everybody's kind of looking at saying, what, the, what are we doing in these areas? What are we trying to do? It's about trying to think about what is going on. It's about trying to think about what's happening. And when we see what's happening, we can do something about it, right? We can start to recognize some of the big activities in the background. Structure is always about keeping your structures up to date, isn't it? You're never going to take account of some of the big block prints that start appearing on the screens. Um, there was a series of uh, very large block prints that started to appear on the spy in the uh, in the afternoon session just a a few short uh, short minutes ago. But obviously these are reported late, so there's not a lot of value in them when they're reported late like this. But I want to just show you some of the um, uh, some of the blocks, right? I want to show you some of the blocks that did show up. So these were some of the block trades that showed up on the SPY at 10 past 10 Eastern. So that's 1510 Eastern. So at 1510 Eastern, we started to see some of these big block prints going through. If you look at the prices, they are all pretty much block prices at the same level. 384.94, 384.94, 384.69. So you can see what these trades are. Now you look at it and you say to yourself, 10 past 10 past 10. So in other words, this is 10 past 10 here. Big block trades at 384. 94. 384, 94 is at that price just there. 384, 94 is at that price right there. Now obviously, that's right on 10 past 10 past at uh, 10 past 10, right? Right on 10 past 10 as a block trade. You can see somebody did $115 million, $116 million, $96 million, and $96 million, all roughly at the same price. So you can see that there is a huge amount of cash up here. Now, why would anybody do a trade at that price? Why would anybody do a block trade at that price? In other words, what is that block trade? Now, the first feeling is this isn't an options trade, guys. This is an actual block trade, the physical, physical stock, the SPY. It's a total value of $400 million. So somebody is doing a trade for $400 million at that price. You may be saying, what the hell is somebody doing a trade of $400 million at that price for? Why would somebody do $400 million there? And why did the price, that must have been a sell trade, right? No, not right. Not right. It's probably more likely to be a buy trade. Now, some people say, why would that ever be the case? I, do, I just don't get that. You've, I've said this before. And a lot of people think to themselves, no, nope, no, nope, sorry, I don't understand why that's more likely to be a buy trade. Let's think about it. If you've got a price coming in, right, and you're looking to do a and you're looking to do a block buy trade, if I try and do a block buy trade at this price with the market maker, do you think they're going to give me that price? Do you think there's any chance on the planet that somebody is going to sell four hundred million dollars to me at that price. Well, if they're stupid, if they're absolutely dumbass, then they might, right? 
the only place I could probably ever imagine of getting a long trade for $400 million is where? The only place I could expect to get $400 million of long trade would probably be about this price here, right? Would that be reasonable, guys? Would everybody agree that that's a reasonable thing to say? If I want to get long $400 million, I'm probably going to have to pay that price. And obviously what that means is that the market maker will do that bit of business. They'll, they'll do that business at that price, okay? And what the market maker has as an understanding is that this guy doesn't mark up the price. The market maker has these understandings. A lot of people think that it's a battle between two, two different people. But if you're on the pit, you'll give a nod and a wink to a market maker, for example. It's not in your interest to it's not in your interest to screw over the dealers as a commercial because they'll get you back at some stage. They'll they'll do a, dir a dirty on you at some stage. And what happens in the floor is outside the floor discussions always take place. You might say that shouldn't ever be allowed. It always happens. Any of the guys that have ever been on the floor will know this. Discussions take place. I'll make sure you're made all right on this trade. I'll make sure you're made all right in the next trade. If, you, if I sell to you at that price, will you promise not to mark up the price so that we drive it back down? The answer is yes, absolutely. So the market maker agrees to do $400 million of massive volume at that price for a commercial buyer. They agree to do $400 million at that price so long as this guy doesn't pay across the spread to do some more business at that price there. And because of that, the market maker now has all of this area here to work out of that trade. Bearing in mind the market maker, the dealer is short $400 million at that price. They're short $400 million. What a damn trade, right? Right, guys, <clears throat> so so the dealer's got a great opportunity to now get rid of that trade into the lows, and the dealer obviously is now holding a huge short inventory, so they need the price to go down. And as the price goes down, the dealer obviously does the necessary. They act like a commercial. They buy into that phase, don't they? They buy into that little phase there, and that's how that trade that trade transpires because nobody knows about this trade because. It's done in the dark pools. It's done in the dark pool, so nobody knows about that bit of business. So when I see a big dark pool block trade or whatever showing up at those prices that nobody can see, then obviously what happens, of course, is that there's no noticeable change in volumes during that period, right? No noticeable change in volumes during that period. And obviously what happens, of course, is that, uh, you know, subsequent to that uh, trade, you can see that the price then breaks nice and easily away from those lower low prints. You're never going to know about these things. I mean, these are the things that ultimately, you know, they creep in under the radar because by the time you know about them, they've already been done. The market makers already had half an hour to uh, basically get rid of the trade without anybody knowing about it. Um, but when you then do see it, and you see somebody that's just paid what looks like a ridiculous price, and you think to yourself, that's a sell. Seriously? When you see a block trade at that price, the chances are it's not a sell trade. Because why would the market maker give you a sell trade at that price? It looks a little bit obvious that that would never be a sell trade either, because the market maker might give you a sell trade, but they would quote this price to you in a block, wouldn't they? If you want to, if you want to sell it, they're going to give you the bottom tick price for four hundred million. They're not going to give you a top tick price. So when you see a block trade coming through on the screens or dark pool trades coming through on the screens, if it's on an uptick from a bottom edge, it's actually bullish. 
So when that information comes to light around about 1540, when you finally catch up with what's been presented, if you finally catch up with something that's presented about there, your job then becomes to watch these areas and say, you know what, if I could get a little buy trade into this phase, I think I could probably make some cash on the buy side of the book, you know, because you've now got a $400 million buyer above you. So then it becomes a job to try and trade into the springs into those areas, which results in this very, very sizable break higher. And you can see what happened there. You get a very, very nice little buy side structure developing, which allowed the locals to lean against that $400 million trade in the background. Lovely. Nice stuff. So market structures. So, um, you know, we've obviously had a lot of discussion about market structures. Uh, there's been a lot of questions about the market structure concept, about when do we use it, where do we use it from, how often do we update it, all those, uh, well, very obvious uh, elements, all those very obvious elements. And uh, when we talk about very obvious elements, it's not that difficult to recognize what is obvious about these elements. Look, you know, we had this structure in the background that we talked about earlier. You've obviously got a top edge of a market there. You've got a mid price here. You've got a bottom edge here. So when you're looking at this five minute chart, all of a sudden those structures hold true. They all hold true, don't they? Every single one of these structures holds true in terms of how they respond. It's not to the tick. It's not exactly to the point of uh, a top edge or a bottom edge. It's not exactly where it should be. It's always either just short of a level or just through a level. It's always just a little bit awkward to do a bit of business. If only they traded to the tick to these levels always, things would be a far easier trade, wouldn't they? If I go from the high print, for example, here to the low print, for example, here, exactly to the tick, you can see we actually run the stops against that level. We run the stops against that level right there, don't we? So when we run the stops against that level, we can start to recognize activity. We can start to see stop runs. We can start to see these areas running through these prices. We can start to worry about what's happening in this area. We don't have, if we buy it straight away here, we get stopped out because we've bought too soon. The best way to deal in these areas is to watch the stops, watch the levels, watch the volumes, and then watch the buyers leaning against the seller. There was a question earlier about a big volume trade, and do you always lean against a volume trade? Um, uh, Dimitri asked a question earlier about do we use limit orders into trades, and, and why would this be a lean instead of a, just a normal limit order? And the answer is it's not to do with that. It's, it's more to do with what trade type size you've got available to you. For example, as an institutional buyer, this is a very doable buy as the price drops down through this area, but it's a fairly sizable drop, right? It drops through the stops at 39.37. It doesn't stop dropping until 39.20. It's a 17, 18 tick drop through that phase. For some of you, that's not a problem. You could buy a lot of times in this area here, but for a lot of retail traders, you might well have got to try to buy in after five ticks, in which case you get stopped out. You might have tried to buy in after 10 ticks or 15 ticks. You might have still got stopped out. For the commercial, the whole area might have been a buy trade. The whole trade area might have been a buy opportunity as it ran into that liquidity. Obviously, if I look at the volume in the background during that period, you can see the volume did start to increase on the down tick into the bottom prints. Drill down into a one-minute chart, and the bottom edge becomes even more pretty obvious. You start seeing a retest. You start seeing a lot of different things. You start seeing a lack of any selling coming in on the retest. So you can see how this bottom edge evolves in these lower prints. You can see as we come up into the capper price, which is now very, very clearly obvious, into the capper price, which is now really obvious at that price level right there, 39.40. And you can see that into the bottom edge, into the capper price, into the retest, there was a little spring trade right there. 
and then you see the market marking up. Now you might say, but that marked away past the cap or target price. Yep, it did. We also had a, a top edge uh, target price in mind, which was here, of course. You can see that in the background. There was a top edge structure to this. And uh, the price got to that top edge structure, ran through that top edge structure, found some enormous stops right at 4 o'clock, which obviously is the London fix level, ran the stops at the London fix, and that was it. Perhaps, perhaps even the trade finished at that point. When we stop a second and think about this, this here, that's all a commercial buy. All of this is a commercial buy trade. It's not about a single candle or a single block print. If I'm going to buy something, literally every two ticks wide, there's a buy trade sitting passively on the limit orders or working orders against those every few ticks. It's not about one, and it's constantly adjusting to the amount of volume that's selling into that. If there's a lot of volume, we try and buy less. You might say, why would you try and buy less? Because if there's a lot of sell volume, we might get a better lower price, and we watch the volume. But if the next down tick has less volume, we try and buy more. Why? Because we obviously can sense a bottom edge starting to get put in. The bigger the volume in the early stages, the better the accumulation becomes for the buyers. But obviously, we still let the price drop as much as possible. In other words, we have that passive approach in the early stages of trading. We've highlighted this many times, in fact, in trading uh, analysis when we've looked at algorithmic activities. In the early stages of a move into a buy zone, we are very passive. That's why we get accelerations. We pull away liquidity. We pull away the buy orders if we see that there's still a lot of selling coming in behind it. We pull away to try and let the price drop to as low a starting point as possible. And when we get that low starting point and the highest volume point, then we start saying, right, we've now got a good separation for value, and then we start attacking it with some size. And that's why we start attacking it with some size. Why would I want to buy at 37 when there's still enough selling coming in at 37 to try and buy at 30s or 25s or 20s? It shouldn't make any sense to anybody. It should be pretty obvious that we want to let this price drop through as much as possible. And as we drive down into these, uh, these bottom edges, you can see that there was starting to see the buying crossing the spreads just here. Look at what happened on these candles. Remember we talked about the hidden buyers. Does anybody see any evidence of hidden buyers after that big volume down candle here? Well, take a look at it, guys. Take a look at it. How many people have already forgotten about hidden buyers? Well, take a look at those pin candles there. Buyers, 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 buyers. Overlapping at slightly higher prices. Why? Because the volume's now dropping. Do you see that, Jared? The volume's dropping in the background. So when the volume starts dropping in the background, the only way I can do business is to pay across the spread into the sell liquidity. So I start buying into those areas there as a commercial buyer, buying there, buying there, buying there, buying there, and you know trying to avoid putting buy limits in because buy limits stop the price from moving. When the price finally breaks the lows, you can see the buy the volume surges, and that's when the buy limit comes back in at that point. So you can see that the buy stop orders were on this candle. The buy stop orders here, the buy stop orders here, and the buy stop orders here. They're all the buy stop orders through that phase, buy limit orders. Then the buy stop order comes back in again this time here. But now that buy stop order is now causing the market to move back to the upside. So you have to slow your buying down again. Slow your buying down. And guess what happens? The buying slows down. It allows the sellers to regroup. The sellers start uh, capping into this price, and maybe you cap into this price here, and force the price back down again. But this time, when you force the price down, there's no sellers anywhere to be seen. Sellers are finished with the down move. If the sellers are finished with the down move, take a look. You widen the stops. You widen the spreads. You try and get a new bottom edge. It doesn't happen. And you start buying into this. And then look at what happens on this candle. 
hidden buying on this candle again, see it? So you buy on the down tick, you've now recognized that it stopped the price, you buy on the up tick into those pins, and now the trade's pretty much finished. At that stage, now what's going to happen is you're going to start finding that you're going to end up starting to cross into the very, very top edge, and you can start to see the hidden buyers appearing in this area here. It runs into the spring at the bottom edge just here. There's a spring trade there. It runs into the spring. There's the spring right there. And obviously, the takeaway from that is just a genius trade, right? It's just a genius trade right there. The takeaway from that trade is beautiful, isn't it? And that's it. That's all we do in trading, isn't it? That's all we work on in trading. We see these little trade levels. We start working into these little trade areas. And this is obviously what we're talking about here is Andy's trade. This is Andy's trade. You get it? This is the pound that Andy was talking about. I assume this is the trade that Andy's talking about. It's a sequence. It's a sequence of events that you read into as the accumulation takes place. Now, when we zoom back out of this trade, what is it that becomes visible? It's not a buy trade on its own, is it? It's not a single price point. It's not something you look at and say, there it is, there's the buy opportunity. It's a sequence of events. If this was a commercial buy zone, you can see that most of the activity is focused on the front end of the chart. Most of the activity is focused in these candles here. Most of the activity is a buy trade at this price area here. So if I draw that area, you can see that we are very low in the water in this buy trade. And we can see if you're at that low in the water, that's a great trade, isn't it? That's a genuinely fantastic trade with a genuinely fantastic outcome through to the top edges up here. And when you see that evolving, you can't unsee it, guys. You can't unsee it. That's what you've got to try and look at when you're looking at a bar by bar analysis. But obviously, you've got to try and understand that this level was already known to you on the background, wasn't it? In the background, you already knew that this level existed. And obviously, your decision is based around whether you want to do anything about it. By knowing that the level exists and then recognizing that you want to do something about it, you can start to then look for whatever it is you're needing to see at that price, right? You can look for whatever it is you're needing to see, whether it's a 10 spread, whether it's a gilt trade going bullish. And you can see if I look at what happened on gilts, it's just crazy good. It doesn't necessarily mean that that's what's happening on the 10 spreads, but it's crazy good on the gilts. It's happening on the 10 spreads as well, guys. No wonder Andy wanted the buy side on the pound. That's a crazy, crazy good buy, uh, buy trade right there, isn't it? 3925s commercial buy, 3990s on the top side. Brilliant, lovely, delicious, whatever you want to call it. It's just a great trade, guys. Let's take a little break, come back and we'll look at some other markets today. <laughs>